If you want to find most of the world's biggest, fastest, scariest, and weirdest sharks, you can find them in American waters. Coming face to face with U.S. shark citizens can be almost too thrilling. From Maine to Alaska is a 13,000 mile journey that takes us to America's best shark hotspots. We'll stop off at Shark Bite Central. Visit shipwrecks that are new homes for sharks. Catch up with the latest shark science. And spend time with people who have lived for and nearly died for America's sharks. Come with us on a trip around the shark-spangled map of the USA. Say shark in America, and people think Jaws. But it wasn't always like that. A hundred years ago, swimming in the sea was all the rage, and no one ever gave sharks a second thought. Steamship magnate Herman Orlix even offered a $500 reward for an authenticated case of a shark attack in temperate waters. He kept his money, but be careful what you wish for. In the bloody summer of 1916, five people were killed. The most likely culprit was a bull shark, but the great white took the rap. And America woke up to sharks. Sharks became notorious when Spielberg's Jaws came out, fueling fear and fascination. And the best place to start an American shark journey is where it all began, off the coast near New York. The cold waters here hide a lot of sharks. Close to shore are the dangerous bull sharks and the occasional white. Farther out, you'll see basking sharks, poor beagles, threshers, and makos. Blue sharks come here as visitors. In the deep water beyond Cape Cod are some strange residents and a very unusual summer tourist. It's a great place for deep sea sharks, but to see them, you need a special submarine. We were about 100 miles east of New York Harbor, and the plan was just to touch the bottom at 3,000 feet, do a, a short report on the conditions, and then work our way back up through the water column. But what started out as a routine dive became anything but normal. At this depth, tons of water bear down on the submersible. A diver would die a horrible death, yet there's a great variety of sharks. There's the smooth hound, which migrates great distances over the seabed. And a hammerhead shark, hardly ever seen this deep. And a cat shark. Uh, about a third of all species of known sharks are deep water sharks that, that would occur, say, in water deeper than 200 meters. Most of them are small, about a meter in size. And the, the most striking feature of these deep sea sharks is most of them are black and they have large green eyes. Such as this rat tail, a peculiar American shark. It has big eyes, well adapted to deep water gloom. Just as the submersible was about to return to the surface, they bumped into a monster. Hey, look at that. Oh my god, look at this. Don't come through here. Ah, don't hit that. Oh, jeez. I'd say he was uh, three to four feet broad across his head <laughs> and 14 to 16 feet long. It was a Greenland shark, found in deep, cold waters from Greenland all down our east coast to New York. So what do we know about the Greenland shark? It grows to a massive 22 feet, but there are no records of it attacking people. The Greenland shark is virtually blind because worm-like parasites grow over its eyes. Maybe that's why it bumps into things. Like all sharks, it's got a good sense of smell, which it uses to find some unusual dinners. Uh, occasionally, they eat really, really big meals. Uh, I've heard of a reindeer being found in one. 
No, I would imagine it, it, it fell off a boat or something, but, and often uh, they'll eat each other as a good meal. With only an inch of acrylic between him and the shark, the pilot was lucky that Greenland sharks don't consider submarines edible. I think once he found out he couldn't eat that light, he decided he needed to come out, so he kind of backed out a little bit and on his way. It was an amazing incident. The more we look, the more we're finding. We're still finding new species of sharks, especially deep sea sharks, almost, almost every trip. Yeah. But finding sharks in the open ocean is a lottery. So let's head down the coast to a shark hotspot. 500 miles south, the water is warmer and the seabed is sandy, so the mix of sharks changes. Big ones like black tips, silkies, and topes. And once again, our friend, the great white. Farther out, there are cat sharks, dogfish, and the unusual six gill shark. And down on the seabed, off North Carolina, there's an unusual hot spot for sand tigers. This is probably the best place in the world to see these sharks, but the big ones here can be a handful. We were filming uh, sand tiger sharks off North Carolina. And uh, at one point, I pushed one of the sand tiger sharks with my hand, and uh, it immediately snarled and bit my camera. These sand tiger sharks, um, when you push them, they bite back. But why are there so many sand tigers here? During World War II, this coast was a battleground between German U-boats and U.S. ships taking supplies to Europe. Two of these old enemies, the freighter Papoose and the U-352, now lie side by side at the bottom of the sea. The wrecks, sticking out of the sand, provide a place for barnacles and corals to settle. These ships have become artificial reefs, a welcoming home for fish. And where there are fish, there are sharks. Bob Cranston has spent over 30 years diving with and filming sharks, and in his opinion, this is a great place to see these magnificent sand tigers. These sand tiger sharks are covered with um, these wonderful little bait fish. The bait fish are going to the sand tiger sharks for protection against the jacks and the other fish that feed on them. But these little fish are too small for the sand tigers to bother with. They're going after bigger fry. We would see rust marks and scratches on the noses of these uh, sand tiger sharks, and we thought, well, they're feeding uh, on sleeping fish that are living in the cracks and crevices of the shipwrecks. Canned in the steel structure, the fish are easy to catch, and sand tigers use their rows of teeth to spike the fish. But do these scary-looking sharks threaten people? Cruising at up to 25 miles an hour, tigers chase live fish. They'll eat almost anything, even tin cans. Their normal diet includes crab, lobsters, and squid, but not humans, which is just as well since they can grow up to a massive 15 feet long. During the day, the sand tiger sharks were moving slowly. Uh, we'd get our cameras right close to them. But at night, everything changed. At night, the sharks were fast moving, aggressive hunters. The 
sharks have a, a wide variety of senses which perhaps give them more of an advantage at night. Like most sharks, pits on the head of the sand tiger are able to detect minute electrical fields from the fish they hunt. They're so sensitive they can detect electrical changes of only five billionths of a volt. And sand tigers aren't just sensitive, they're smart too. A inexperienced diver killed a sand tiger shark on one of these shipwrecks. The next day, all of the sharks were gone. It took two years for these sand tiger sharks to repopulate that particular shipwreck. So as scary as they look, these are gentle giants, sensitive to the way we behave around them. But you don't have to be a diver to have close encounters of a shark kind. Head a thousand miles south to Daytona, Florida, and there are plenty of sharks to look for. You'll find lemon sharks, nurse sharks, sandbar sharks, and bonnet heads. Black tips and sand tigers live here too, along with the ferocious bull sharks. Why do all these sharks come here? Because all along the Florida coast, river inlets provide food and shelter for young sharks. But Daytona Beach is a great place for young people too. It's famous for sun, sand, and surfing. Lots of people mixing with lots of sharks have made Daytona the so-called shark bite capital of the world. But is Daytona's bark worse than its bite? Jason Williams is one person who should know. He's a surfer who's come foot to face with the local wildlife. I just got off a wave and then uh, I was standing on the sandbar about to jump back on my board and paddle back out and uh, just out of nowhere, all of a sudden, my foot was in a shark's mouth. There was a, a really strong burst of energy. I mean, when it hit me, it was like somebody hit me with a bat. But what kind of shark was responsible? A shark bit me like this and you could see a tear into my tendon. That's the way the teeth went. There's 34 puncture wounds, I believe. These are the stab wounds of a juvenile shark, and the likely suspect is a young black tip, or a more ferocious bull shark. Daytona's fame reached a peak in 2001, but it was the kind of fame a seaside resort could do without. Yet lifeguard Scott Peterson knew the bites were no cause for panic. 2001 um, was dubbed the year of the shark. That was the most uh, bites worldwide that had ever been recorded. In an average year, there are about 50 shark bites in the whole country. And in 2001, nearly half came from Daytona. No one died and most were minor bites, but press crews from all over the world flooded here, mistakenly thinking of the hysteria caused by Jaws. Down on the beach, you could hardly move for news crews, but this was more of a media frenzy than a shark frenzy. There were certainly an unusual number of shark reports, but they weren't full-on Jaws-style attacks. They were exploratory nibbles. Just the same, why were there so many of them? If you're flying over it, you'd see this big column of murky water thrusting out between two stone jetties. And that just so happens to be this sandbar where these beautiful waves peak up and break. So that murky water is good cover for bait fish. Bait fish can be any type of fish that's eaten by other fish, and they're often seen at fertile river mouths where they come to feed. These heaving shoals attract all sorts of predators, including birds, dolphins, and of course, sharks. We saw a lot of the telltale signs, birds diving down, uh, bait fish swimming around, stirring up the water, um, and I saw a shark in the face of a wave. 
and it looked to me to be a bull shark. But the waves were so good. <laughs> Jason's risk didn't pay off that day, but how much of a risk was it? The sharks that live here, like young nurse and lemon sharks, eat fish. Even the bull sharks, said by some to be America's deadliest, are just juniors, and none of them were actually attacking people. An attack is where you're the shark's prey, and he's coming after you. You know, he intends to bite you. Um, most of what happens here, if not all of what happens here, is a shark going after fish. And like the bottom of my foot, for some reason, the light or whatever looked like a fish that day. It's not certain which of our young shark suspects bit Jason, but one thing's for sure. Avoiding river mouths is a good way of avoiding sharks' mouths. The warm and sheltered waters of the Sunshine State are a magnet to sharks. Inshore, there are shark nurseries where young bull sharks, black tips, and lemon sharks grow before heading out to the open sea. At least two dozen types of sharks live here, including nurse sharks and bonnet heads. Plus the less well-known black nose, big nose, and shark nose. But the coral reefs also attract some of our strangest sharks, the hammerheads. These sharks come to the reefs during the day to be cleaned by smaller fish, which give them a kind of skin manicure and pick off parasites. Hammerheads are fantastic American sharks. There are at least three kinds, and they all have a wide head. Why? Simple. It places their electrical sense organs wider apart so they can detect prey more accurately. The great hammerhead, 15 feet long, can be aggressive. Scalloped hammerheads are unusual because they're social. During the day, the females hang out in big schools. But other species are mostly solitary, like the lemon shark, a shallow water species named for its yellow skin. This is a powerful 10-foot shark, though fortunately it's strictly a fish eater. Researchers used to think lemons were loners, but further down the Florida coast, near Miami, they seem to have proved the scientists wrong. In 2003, hundreds of lemon sharks were seen in big social groups off this coast. But it's thought they were coming together at breeding time. The females release chemical pheromones into the water, a powerful smell that attracts males from far and wide. So the bigger the group, the bigger the message. As we move around the tip of Florida, we find the same sharks. Lemon sharks, nurse sharks, and bull sharks. They're genuine American sharks. And at Venice Beach, there's evidence that these sharks have been with us for a very long time. Not everyone is here to soak up the sun. Have they lost something? Is there gold in the sand? Not exactly. Well, this particular beach is kind of known as the shark's teeth capital of the world. What I have here is just a jar full, uh, probably represents about two, two years. On a good day, you could find several hundred. On a bad day, you might not find more than a couple. How come this otherwise normal beach is covered with shark's teeth? One of the reasons there are so many shark's teeth here is that sharks shed them all the time. Shark's teeth grow in rows, and as they grow, new teeth replace the old ones. But that in itself isn't enough to create the numbers of shark's teeth on Venice Beach. The shark's teeth that litter the shore here are in fact prehistoric. About 10 million years ago, this part of Florida was underwater and the sea above teemed with sharks. Though there are fewer sharks here today, the fossil teeth show the same species are still around. 
the scavenging nurse shark, the mangrove-dwelling bonnethead, and the fearsome tiger shark are all still found off this shore. Once, there was something much, much bigger off Venice Beach. But its teeth are in deeper water, where only divers can find them. That's an ancient mako shark tooth. These are babies. That's right. Yeah. Another one. That's the ancient mako shark. And then there's part of a megalodon tooth. They're like 60 million years old. This was the largest predator planet Earth had ever seen. It was much bigger than any predatory dinosaur. Megalodon was the biggest meat-eating shark that ever lived. It was 40 feet long. We don't know what it would have done to people, but it sure made mincemeat out of whales. Just as well for us, it became extinct nearly two million years ago. You can get an idea of Megalodon's size by comparing its tooth with the Great White's. Now that it's safe to go in the water, Megalodon relics are worth big bucks. Anytime you get to six inches here in the States, things explode price rise. I have a friend of mine found a seven inch tooth. His price is 25,000 US dollars for it, so it's a nice tooth. But for a lot of people, it's not the money. It's the simple pleasure of collecting prehistoric shark teeth. The fossil teeth at Venice Beach show sharks are an important part of America's distant past, but sharks also played a role in recent history. Detailed study of sharks really began during World War II, when dangerous predators, such as tiger sharks, attacked shipwrecked sailors. The Navy kick-started intensive research into American sharks, and today the biggest centers studying sharks are still in the USA. We often say that we don't know much about sharks. You are hungry, hungry, hungry. But we've learned an awful lot, especially in the last 10 years. And we now know that sharks move in, in very specific ways, that they're not just these nomads that roam all over the sea. They probably know where they are at all times. That's something that's, that's, that's fairly revolutionary and, and fascinating. Bob Hooter is head of Shark Central, the Moat Marine Laboratories, not far from Venice Beach. It's a great location for shark research because the sea inlets are nursery areas for thousands of lemon, blacktip, and bull sharks. This is a blacktip shark. You got the tag number? Yes. Michelle Hoipo of Shark Central has been studying them for six years. She and her colleagues attach special transmitters to track shark movements via listening stations on the seabed. As the shark swims past one of the 20 listening posts, its signal is recorded. When the information is downloaded, Michelle can see where it's been. Yeah, looks like we've got number 573. Um, each colored dot is the location of a shark for Michelle's study group. I like to refer to these kind of projects as my window into the sea. Um, when you look at the animations of what these animals are doing, we can actually really see where they choose to go. Although the bay opens out into the ocean, Michelle's young sharks stay in the shallow water of the inlet. These sharks are only two and a half or three feet long, so they're very small and they'll spend their whole first summer of life in those areas. And they stay there to avoid being eaten by larger sharks that are out in deeper waters. But in September 2001, something happened which took Michelle completely by surprise. Well, it looks like we're in for a tough one tonight, folks, with winds reaching gale force throughout the area. On September 13th, Tropical Storm Gabriel hit Florida's west coast. As soon as the storm was over, Michelle was back on the water, eager to see if her bull sharks had survived. But when she downloaded her data, she was shocked. 
I was very surprised when we looked at the data because it turns out not only did these animals, you know, make it through the storm, but they actually sensed the storm was coming and left this nursery area before the storm made landfall. It must have been something that really alarmed them, some very strong cue that would make them leave because we don't often see them leave the nursery and we certainly don't see them leave in sort of a mass exodus like we did with this storm. So what had made all Michelle's young sharks leave the bay before the storm hit? As the air pressure decreases, then the water pressure also decreases. So if they were in seven feet of water, they may have felt like they were only in five feet of water. So I'm guessing that they left as a means of self-protection. By leaving the shallow bay, Michelle's sharks avoided the storm and saved themselves from being injured in the surge of the hurricane seas. But after the storm passed, they returned to the inlet. Young bull sharks are aggressive hunters, eating fish, turtles, birds, other sharks, and even human refuse. They're important garbage collectors in the ecosystem. After two years inshore, these youngsters are well on the way to being dangerous 10-foot adults and head out into the deeper waters of the Gulf. The Gulf of Mexico is a shark spotter's paradise. Cold water species from the north and tropical species mix in one big shark party. Again, there are bulls and black tips growing up in the coastal inlets. Along the coast, you can see lemon sharks, nurse sharks, and hammerheads. Off the Texas coast, dangerous tiger sharks lie in ambush for passing turtles. And out in the Gulf's open water, there's a whole bunch of really big sharks. Copper whalers, blues, Makos, oceanic white tips, and the largest American shark. But you have to look in some strange places. Out in the Gulf of Mexico, there are over 4,000 oil rigs, their twinkling burn-offs visible from space. The open ocean is a blue desert but these rigs have become an oasis, artificial reefs that provide a foothold for marine animals and coral fish, such as jacks, angels, and groupers. These, in turn, attract the attention of hungry, silky sharks. Under the rig, biologist Jeff Childs encounters sharks in their thousands, huge nursery schools of young silkies. But Jeff's favorite visitor is an ocean-going monster coming in from the vast emptiness of the open sea. A whale shark, the biggest of all sharks, of all fish. It's a rare close-up encounter in American waters. Despite their size, 15 tons and up to 46 feet, it's never easy to track them down because they roam thousands of miles, vacuuming up plankton. They're found off both east and west coasts in summer, but Jeff has discovered that they're particularly attracted to these rigs. The whale sharks would uh, come in, uh, visit the platform. Uh, it appeared that uh, they were curious about the structures. The plankton the whale shark feeds on is almost too small to see, and the huge fish has to work hard, pushing 6,000 gallons of water per hour through its mouth. Researchers think the rigs might help concentrate the plankton, and this could be what attracts these gentle giants. Too often we hear of instances where, where wildlife populations are being adversely impacted by our, our activities. This is an example where a species could be benefiting from it. Open ocean sharks can be long-haul jumbos, like the whale shark, or fast jet fighters like the blue. But both of these are ideally designed for the biggest ocean of all, the Pacific. Over here, the water's about five degrees cooler than on the East Coast, so you find plenty of cold water sharks. There are poor beagles, threshers, and huge basking sharks. You'll also see the species that live on both coasts, the great whites, makos and blues. Inshore, there are smaller species like the horned shark, the leopard shark, and the unusual angel shark, which lies in wait on the seabed. 
The angel shark's flattened body allows it to hide under the sand, but it reacts with surprising speed, and its many small teeth have delivered serious bites to unwary divers. On the west coast, the seabed drops off very quickly, and you're soon into deep, open water. A perfect spot to catch up with two of our fastest sharks. The blue is recognized by its long fins and strange staring eyes, and the mako by its shorter fins and open mouth. Both sharks are very opportunistic, but they have these different personalities. The mako shark is uh, very much a visual hunter. The blue shark, on the other hand, is much more of nose-oriented. It smells things, it goes to it. These jet fighters of the sea can cruise at over 40 miles an hour, so to find a blue shark in these vast open waters is not always easy. But waving a dead fish around is a surefire way of getting close, so Bob wears a stainless steel chainmail shark suit. but he can still get badly bruised. Normally, blue sharks seek out large shoals of bait fish, such as these anchovies, then attack the edge of the bait ball, picking off single fish. But during his filming, Bob discovered blue sharks doing something never mentioned in the textbooks. Nobody understood how blue sharks, which have teeth for catching fish, could feed on krill. Krill normally spread out in the water, and it takes an animal like a blue whale to filter feed and separate the krill from the seawater. Yet blue sharks have been caught with stomachs full of krill. These shots reveal how blue sharks take advantage of other animals' hard work. It's actually the anchovies and the sardines that ball up the krill in such concentrations that then the blue shark can come swimming through the krill ball, chomping away on a shrimp cocktail. But krill definitely isn't on the menu for the mako shark. The mako shark is more aggressive because it's very visual and um, relying on its eyesight to find fast-moving tuna and uh, mackerel. But in the vast open ocean, it can take a lot of searching to find food. We once tagged a mako shark off of San Diego, and three days later it was caught by a fisherman off Santa Barbara. That's a hundred miles a day. Now, I don't think that sharks swim 100 miles every day, but when a shark is looking for food, it's covering a lot of ground. Underwater cinematographers spend a lot of time filming sharks, so it's not surprising that they make new discoveries. But there's one American cameraman who got really lucky and filmed a completely new species. Tom Haight was about to film a unique moment in American shark history. He had come face to face with the Megamouth. To be able to go underwater and, and be the first one to shoot underwater photography and underwater video of a creature that has never been documented underwater before is just an awesome thing. It has a massive head and a body up to 17 feet long. It feeds on plankton, but very little else is known about it. This is the only time a living specimen has been filmed. The Megamouth was found when it got tangled in a fisherman's net. Fortunately for Tom, the shark is a filter feeder, like the basking shark, and isn't aggressive. I think if I had first seen it in the water and, and didn't know that it was a shark, I might have mistaked it for a whale. He didn't feel rough like a regular shark. Tom was able to be with the shark for eight hours before it was released. In the last decade, there have only been six more sightings of a megamouth off the coast of California. 
And to this day, Tom is one of the very few people to have been this close to such a rarely seen creature. 400 miles up the coast, near San Francisco, there's another U.S. shark hotspot. In winter, you'll meet cold water species such as salmon and basking sharks. In the summer, the blue shark and the mako come visiting, while the six gill lives here all year round. Deep canyons near the shore shelter dogfish and cat sharks, as well as weird deep water species. But these waters are famous for one shark in particular. This is the real home territory of the great white, Jaws himself. And there are great white attacks here, as the sound man and our film crew discovered when he was surfing off the rocky coastline with a friend. Laying there, looking at it, thinking, I am in such trouble now. It's the most scared I've been in my entire life. We screamed like little children out there for a while. Mike was surfing with his friend Peck Ewer off a rocky outcrop called Maverick Point. As we got in the water and started paddling out, it was a low tide and there were harbor seals on this exposed reef. And, it, and in retrospect, it looked like they were trying to tell us something. We got three quarters of the way out, I guess, and I was looking at a big wave coming in. And I hear a sound that sounded like a watermelon hitting cement. And I look over to see Peck about three feet out of the water in the jaws of a great white shark. And the impact was astounding. The sound of it and the velocity and how high he went out of the water and the force involved and all that. It was a classic great white attack, shooting up at its target from the deep like a bullet. But just as Mike thought the end had come, the shark submerged and disappeared. It seems incredible, but both friends were able to paddle back to shore, and the only damage was to Peck's surfboard. No, I had nothing, so I knew that I wasn't, I was unscathed. And I didn't, we didn't look at the board, we just spun. From the size of the bite on the board, the great white was thought to be a 14-footer, not even a big one. But to survive a great white attack must surely be miraculous, because it really is the ultimate ocean predator. The great white is our most feared shark. It grows to over three tons and up to 23 feet. It's capable of sudden bursts of speed exceeding 40 miles an hour and has the dental equipment to tackle seals and, much more rarely, humans. They are awesome. They will frighten you, but they're not mindless feeding machines or they're not what you see in, in Jaws at all. Peter Klimley has been studying great whites off California for nearly 20 years, and he has a deep respect for these animals. The white sharks are the, um, the football players. They're just awesome individuals, but they also have complexity. They're not, like many football players, are very bright guys. They have a very complex behavior patterns, too. Great whites are well known for killing seals, an important food source for a large shark. So maybe on his surfboard, Peck was mistaken for a seal, but Peter Klimley isn't so sure. I don't agree with the idea that white sharks have a search image for seals. In Northern California, where water visibility is very poor, I think they key on movement at the surface. Here is a shark that is swimming near the bottom, so it sees something really at so just moving, movement alone dashes to the surface, gets it, but only then can it actually make a decision of what it is. I like to call sharks not jaws, I like to call them lips, because they can take things in their mouth and make this decision of whether they're going to eat it or not, and if they're not, spit it out. The great white is America's most famous shark, but curiously little is known about its life cycle. Scientists didn't know how young great whites grow to become ocean giants, so it was a stroke of luck when Monterey Bay Aquarium rescued a juvenile great white caught by a local fisherman. A shark! 
The new exhibit was a great hit. The public loved it, but the scientists loved it even more. It was a unique opportunity to study a young great white for the first time. Kevin Lewand is keeper in charge of the great white. Even though he's had experience of other sharks, he knows this young female is special. I think the public sometimes will see it, look at the white shark and they're waiting to see this huge, ferocious, large, man-eating shark. The animal is dangerous. Um, but having this animal here as far as being in captivity and just seeing how graceful it is has really been a treat for everyone, I think. It's a treat for marine scientists, too. They found that young great whites are very different from the adults. Their jaws are less muscular, their teeth are more pointed, and they feed on fish, not fatty seal meat. Kevin devised special feeding methods that mimic the way a young great white would catch live fish in the wild. He hoped that keeping the shark well fed would stop it attacking other fish in the tank. This worked, but only for a while. So the team had to return her to the sea. The Monterey Bay Aquarium now holds the record for keeping a great white in captivity, 200 days. And they're confident they could do it again with another rescued great white. Ten thousand miles into our shark quest, we reach Alaska. It's cold. It's tough. Surely there can't be many American sharks here. It's true that these waters are far too chilly for tropical species, and even great whites rarely venture up here. But you do find sharks. Sleeper sharks, spiny dogfish, salmon sharks, and plenty of them because Alaska is an American shark success story. Life is hard in this hostile climate, but the seas are rich. Yet in the last 10 years, there's been a change, and fishermen such as Martin Spargo have noticed something very strange about the fish they're catching. Uh, one of the things about this bay here is I'm seeing an abundance of, of sharks that I haven't seen in the past. It's a big mystery, but we are getting more and more sharks in this region, and we don't know why. Twice each season, Martin sets his lines in the hope of catching halibut, but when he pulls them in, that's not the only fish that he hooks. Now here we have your first shark. This is called a spiny dogfish. When you're fishing for like a species of say codfish and they get on the hooks instead then you get a little sad because what you're after is not to be picking the hooks out of something that you can't utilize. And then if there's a lot of them, well it'll just ruin an awful lot of time and effort into fishing the target species. And he goes. It's on! It's a good day for Martin, but any fish under a legal minimum size has to be returned to the sea if populations are to survive. This has been munched by an undetermined creature down there. And he ate the carcass right off the bones. Now it may be the elusive sleeper yeah, shark. That's, what, it looks, that's what I'm thinking. In the past few years, sleeper sharks have been taking between 20 and 30 percent of the fishermen's catch in these waters. But what sort of shark is the sleeper? Sleepers have rarely been filmed alive, but sightings show them to be wide-bodied sharks up to a massive 22 feet. They move slowly and look almost blind. But haven't we seen them before? In fact, a lot of scientists think it is the same species as the Greenland shark that was spotted off Maine at the start of our journey by the Harbor Branch sub. Rare footage shows a sleeper feeding on a whale carcass at the bottom of the sea, and it's easy to see how it could take the halibut off Martin's lines. But there's another shark out there that's also prospering. It's the salmon shark, and a particular favorite of scientist Bruce White. Salmon sharks are uh, a real interesting looking shark, and I guess you'd say they're kind of a sexy shark because they're in the same family as great white sharks. There's a special adaptation that makes the salmon shark so successful in these cold waters. 
Salmon shark body temperature is about 15 degrees C above ambient water temperature. And this helps the muscles work more efficiently and also the eyes and the brain. It gives this shark an advantage over all the other fish because it can swim faster in cold water and it can probably think faster too. So why do sharks in Alaska appear to be on the increase? Well, as usual, the answer isn't straightforward. There was a change in the ocean in the late 1970s. The, the ocean waters warmed up in the Gulf of Alaska by about two degrees Celsius. And um, large codfish and uh, halibut and arrow-toothed flounder populations picked up. And we're trying to figure out if all these things are related. Is it related back to global warming or fishing practices? That these are some of the questions we're trying to ask. There's lots more questions than there are answers. One thing is certain, though. Shark numbers up here are growing, and that's in stark contrast to anywhere else on the planet. We've come a long way in the last century, from carefree bathing, through mass hysteria, to a much fuller awareness of sharks. On our journey around America, we've met some incredible sharks. Most of them leave us well alone, though sometimes our encounters are way too close. And if you're still scared of sharks, you can always go inland, and you'll surely be safe, right? Wrong. Remember the bull shark, one of our most dangerous. It's implicated in more attacks than any other species, and it doesn't just live in the sea. Bull sharks have super efficient kidneys, so they can actually live in fresh water, and they don't always just hang around the deltas. Imagine Richard Durrett's surprise when he caught a nine-foot shark near St. Louis, 1,750 miles inland. Come upon a shark uh, about 30 feet of water. We caught him in some trammel nets that wasn't expecting to catch. So wherever you are in America, you're never far from an American shark.